I'm very pleased to be here today. It's a, uh, a particular pleasure because I had promised myself that when I retired from the international speaking gate engagement, I would engage myself more with the local community. So this is my first of hopefully many efforts to be more uh, giving back to the communities from which I came. The methods of energy psychology and energy medicine provide an advanced technology wherein the human vibrational matrix is rebalanced in the presence of our thoughts of symptoms, negative emotions, disturbing memories, and worries of the future. In this fashion, balancing the bioenergy system as we know it, healing happens in matters of moments, not necessarily weeks or months or years. We can explain these methods by traditional uh, understandings of desensitization, counter conditioning, but to truly understand how energy works and energy healing works, we really first have to know who we are. Well, these uh, videos are not playing. So, um, who are you? William Tiller in 1997, and thank God for William Tiller for he gave me a theoretical foundation for something about which I was to speak. And his foundation was to give us the physics of being a 10-dimensional creature, a creature of 11 space energy from which precipitates out at a quantum jump from 10 to the minus 29th centimeters, the field of thought. And I could show you Tiller's equations for they're very elegant and not one healthcare professional that I've ever heard him speak to understands them. So I've decided to try to do this in more plain language and some pictures. And so I would ask if you think of the field of thought. I don't know. Here we have an 11 space energy coming down into a field of thought. And this thought is represented in a well-ordered set of nodes. And you can imagine that energy moving unimpeded through these well-ordered set of nodes down towards its next ninth dimensional phenomenon, which are our emotions. And here, those nodes of emotions are again pictured as a well-ordered field through which the energy moves unimpeded. And from that space, we find two four-dimensional conjugate realities existing. One as waveforms that move faster than the speed of light in an etheric world. The other in the what we call real world of particles that move slower than the speed of light. If we were in fact to manifest this reality, it would be much like experiencing heaven on earth. More often what we see is represented by a field of perturbed thoughts. And as the 11 space energy slows down, precipitating into this field of thought, the thought energy is deflected, reflected in a more chaotic fashion, such that when it moves down towards our field of emotion, slowing down one more time, <clears throat> we manifest a series of perturbations in our thought and negative emotions. This breaks down into two conjugate realities where that disturbance is indeed transduced as the energy slows down and slows down to the physical realities of our world into the disordered aspects of the world that we see around us today. William Tiller in 1997 gave us the 
characteristics of the physical world and their conjugate or mirror image in the higher order dimensions. All of the higher order dimensions have the realities of the right as the rules of being. So we can see that we have the sense of direct space and time, for example, in our left hemisphere. And here we have right hemisphere sensing. We have things like electric monopoles versus magnetic monopoles. We have things like gravity and levitation. We have velocity moving slower than the speed of light versus faster than the speed of light. We have positive entropy. We have negative entropy. And suddenly, when I saw that, Lumiere, an answer to a question that had haunted me for so many years. Why would we spirit creatures want to embody ourselves and come to a place where all of these limiting phenomena hold sway? The answer, quite simply, was entropy. What is entropy? Entropy is the force that holds sway in the physical universe where everything deteriorates, decompensates, and breaks apart. It affects our houses, it affects our organizations, it affects everything in the physical plane. So again, why would we as spirit creatures with aspects of ourselves being 10-dimensional and 9-dimensional that work outside of the space-time restrictions, why would we desire to be in this place? Fundamentally, the answer occurred to me that we need to be in this place in order to gain the skills of creating wholeness and unity and oneness, which automatically obtain in the higher order dimensions. This physical world provides us something as a learning center, things to work against, to work against the force of entropy, to create the wholeness and wellness that's possible. Uh, again, I see I have embedded videos here, which for some reason uh, don't quite work in this scenario. So we come to this place, and as healers, by increasing the unimpeded flow of life energy into this plane of existence, this force which Claude Swanson so powerfully demonstrated to be the fifth force in the universe, the one that has kept scientists from unifying the four known forces, a building energy which reverses entropy and brings order out of chaos, which makes life possible. Energy medicine, energy psychology uses three of the major bioenergy systems that are part of our being. We use the meridian system, with which most of us, I think, are familiar. We use the system of chakra energy, interrelated to that of the meridians, and the third, generated by the chakras, the biofield. And what we discover is that by rebalancing this human vibrational matrix in the presence of disturbing thoughts, emotions, and physical realities. We can change those realities in a very uh, unique and rapid fashion. Today we're going to focus on the acupuncture meridian system, for it is the best known and most studied in the Western civilization. Acupuncture is uh, four or 5,000 years old. We saw this with Etsy the Iceman, for example, who had tattoos that showed the acupuncture meridian points that would be used today to treat his illnesses. Uh, we have Chinese writings back from before the Common Era. Uh, the earliest acupuncture people derive their benefits, perhaps, from this. Or perhaps not. The meridians form a system of channels through which moves life energy, chi, prana, has many names. 
There are 12 primary meridians and two central vessels, which are extraordinary, that are commonly used. These meridians correlate with organ systems as well as emotion. And we can have identified today through science a number of different ways that these meridians conduct information. One might be mechanical, as happens with needles. Another might be electromagnetic, as happens through the piezoelectric effect. That's one explanation for why when we tap on a meridian uh, that lies at the surface of the body, the body being crystalline structure, both in bone and uh, other fashions, releases an electrical impulse each time we tap on a meridian. And that's tapping therapies rely on this piezoelectric effect to electrically activate or stimulate meridians. Meridians can also be activated uh, and transduce light. They transduce um, electromagnetic radiation. And these are the traditional drawings of the acupuncture meridians uh, with which some of you might be familiar. In our modern science, we found good evidence for the existence of the meridians, which up until uh, the last part of the century really remained somewhat elusive to scientists. We've detected them with radioactive isotopes, Verna Joule here in 1985, introduced technetium as a radioactive substance on a meridian point, and when he did that, he was able to visualize the radioactive flow along the channels or meridians of the body. Uh, when that same technetium was introduced to a random spot on the body, what we found was simply a globular cluster. So more, much more recently, we've discovered that um, the meridian points exist and come into being at places where C fibers branch. Uh, that's a relatively recent finding. And we've also seen things like when we activate meridian points uh, associated with the visual cortex, we find that the visual cortex lights up and becomes quite active. We also have people back uh, in the 60s, Kim Bon Han, I think, was the first person from uh, North Korea who detected the uh, Kim Bon Han ducks, which were actually acupuncture meridians, and found high levels of RNA, DNA, um, hyaluronic acid, many of the substances and hormonal things in very high concentrations flowing through these, and he found those in rabbits. Meridian points are really much more than uh, we might imagine. William Tiller demonstrated that a meridian uh, has an ion flow from inside the body, moving upwards towards the skin, and then radiating out like an umbrella. So if in three dimensions, if you were to look down on it, it would look like a circle. Tiller also gives us the physics of uh, biologic antenna and shows that each acupuncture meridian point is, in fact, a dipole antenna. So imagine a system of antenna that are hooked up in an array, much like the meridians are, much like what we would use to plumb the depths of the universe with radio telescopes. And imagine a machine that employed not one frequency tuned array, but 14 of these. And what you have is the hardware of the human being. That each and every one of us is endowed with the most incredible information transmission and reception system uh, that's ever been invented. Which begs the question, to whom are we transmitting information, and perhaps to whom are we, from whom are we receiving it? Uh, the morphic field, the thought field, each other, alien beings, use your imagination. Tiller goes on to show that children see in the etheric. Somehow, over time, we seem to lose the abilities that we're born with. In the particular experiments here, Tiller simply, oops, my bad. I don't know. 
There are two metal plates through which an electric current is passed. Adults see nothing in between the two metal plates, but children reliably draw the same patterns at the same voltages. And here are two examples of what children draw in between the two plates with different voltages where adults see nothing. He further goes on to show that uh, when we use a prism, we know a prism breaks the light into a rainbow. So again. In the conjugate universe, that rainbow would be its inverse, and the color pattern would be exactly reversed, so that instead of having the red, yellow, uh, blue, violet, it would go in the opposite direction. And when Tiller has children look at these things, what he finds is that they indeed do see the etherics, and they also see these things in their harmonics, as is predicted. The bottom line is that we are all incredibly psychically gifted. We have all of the hardware. Uh, Dr. Russell Targ led the Stanford Research Institute and looked at the phenomenon of remote viewing. Initially, he simply had a student come in and meet with another student in his laboratory. One student would stay with him and another would go out with a, an associate. And at an appointed time, he would simply sit down wherever he was and look at something and send back that image as best he could to the person he had met earlier. Over time, the drawings, which simply started out to be a line here or a line there, began to be somewhat, somewhat more uh, accurate. And as you can see, uh, some of the early drawings began to resemble what was being looked at. Here's the ears and here's the eye of the horse. After a while, the remote viewers became fairly accurate and could actually draw pictures that were recognizable of what was being looked at. And at that point, the CIA got involved because they were very interested in this technology. Uh, so they sent someone to see Targ's demonstration. Uh, they put a little wrinkle in it, that is, instead of having the associate take somebody out to some place in the city, they took the uh, associate and took them to a place in the desert very quickly by helicopter. And then at the appointed time, the drawing was made, they flew the person back, all unbeknownst to Dr. Targ, and lo and behold, they got a picture of an adobe hut that was being looked at in an adobe building. The CIA took over the remote viewing project, and after a while, many years, the people who started this, this project as remote viewers with no psychic abilities whatsoever became so proficient that all that they would require would be a latitude and longitude, and they could see what was there. In one of the declassified uh, by Freedom of Information Act uh, secrets of the CIA, we have an example of what kinds of things happened when the CIA would give a latitude and a longitude and see the drawings that were made that very closely resembled exactly what was there. And the CIA came back and says, yes, you're at the right place. Here's the spy satellite photographs. So we can see this from space. What we really want to know is what's going on inside of that building. And inside of that building was drawn and described a uh, containment vessel, which the top was uh, an 80 or 60 meter sphere of steel that was being put together in orange peeled segments, and they were told that the welding process was having a great deal of difficulty. Later, this was confirmed a couple of years later um, by space satellite photographs when these vessels were removed from the housing uh, that they were in. So we all have the hardware to do all forms of psychic ability. And the question is, how do we do that? In energy psychology, in a comprehensive energy psychology at the professional level, we use muscle testing in order to gain information to guide us in the rebalancing and harmonization of the human's bioenergy fields. We know that muscle testing is really training wheels for our intuition. 
and that by using these methods over and over and over again, we come to know the truth of those inquiries into the field in a much more immediate fashion so that ultimately muscle testing isn't required because we have an understanding of an, our own self-awareness and self-attunement. How does this apply to you? Have you ever had the thought, oh, I think that thing is going to fall and break? Well, I used to have that thought many years ago. And then, of course, sooner or later, that thing would fall and break. And I would say to my wife, you know, I knew that that was going to fall down and break. And she would say to me, well, if you knew it was going to fall down and break, why didn't you just move it? Well, I needed to see it fall down and break over and over again until finally I had enough feedback and experience to understand and believe in the intuition or the knowing that I had that I couldn't otherwise explain. Energy psychology can be explained in a fairly straightforward way to much of our, most of our traditional colleagues as providing an efficient way to deactivate the stress, fight, flight, or freeze response that's associated with disturbing thoughts and memories and pair them with a calmer emotional state. It's a very straightforward classical conditioning exposure type explanation of what energy psychology is. What happens when we tap? Today we've found that several things happen. Certainly the relaxation response is activated. We find the counter conditioning occurs, that is the pairing of something with uh, a calming effect. Our neurochemistry changes. We find changes in the endorphins increase. There's a decrease in pain. I've often said that I've never met a pain that couldn't be reduced by 50% in a matter of minutes. I stand by that claim even to today. Increases in serotonin, cortisol levels become regulated, gamma-aminobutyric acid increases, we find the brain relaxing, the limbic system changes, it's calmed, we find changes in the uh, amygdala, parasympathetic nervous system turns on and we also find uh, heart uh, rate variability becoming calming and more regular. How can we explain how energy psychology works? One of those explanatory models is certainly based upon our physiological models of reduction of limbic arousal, decreases anxiety, changes the pathways that are related to our memories. We can also look at the interruption of the pattern in that limbic system, those entrenched post-traumatic memories being interrupted so that other systems can function in a more orderly fashion. I'm sorry. Yeah. Energy psychology can certainly be talked about, as I've mentioned, in terms of exposure therapy and counter conditioning. All of these protocols that we use in energy psychology, in some fashion or another, bring into conscious awareness and expose someone to a previously disturbing memory, thought of some kind, physical symptom, pain, things of this nature. And the stimulation of acupuncture points has been shown over the course of a 10-year study at Harvard Medical School to rapidly reduce limbic system arousal. And in this sense, energy psychology is combining a somatic desensitization with exposure uh, to something which has disturbing and arousing values. Other levels of explanation have to do with, oh, sorry, I'm back to the wrong place here. Measurable electromagnetic 
systems. We have the piezoelectric effect, which I've mentioned. We have uh, Radin, who's looked at emanations from hands. We have Qigong and many other forms of healing, which have an electromagnetic component that correlates with healing. And non-material information transfer, that's the explanation that I gave to you at first as you looked at the transduction of information down through different levels of reality. Essentially what we're saying is that the field of thought is the initial domino. No one has really explained what's in the 11 space energy, how many different dimensions there may be, but for sure we know that at least we have non-physical aspects of our reality as human beings. Our thought and our emotions are two things that are indeed part of us that are non-physical and so part of our spiritual self. It's said that the only memory that we have that's accurate is one of which we've never remembered. For every time we take a memory out, it changes based upon what we experience at the time. And so when we take a memory out, when we bring a thought to mind that has a great disturbance value to it, and we do something that reharmonizes and rebalances the human vibrational matrix, when we put that memory back, it is a different memory. Very often when we're working with people who have very disturbing traumatic memories, we find that after that rebalancing has occurred, and again, that can happen in the matter of minutes and often it seems to happen at a particular moment in time. When they are thinking about that memory, again, they say, I can't think of it. They'll describe it just as they had described it, but it doesn't feel like it's the same memory, and so they don't believe that they're actually thinking about the same thing. Changes in the way we feel when they happen so rapidly cause people to wonder exactly what's going on. And this is known as the apex effect in the field where people cannot quite make sense out of such a rapid change in the nature of their feelings. Um, back in the early 90s, I was doing uh, late 80s, early 90s, I was doing research into EMDR, and I had a patient referred to me from the Cleveland Clinic with an, uh, tractable hypertension. Uh, she had been assaulted and had a uh, very limited amount of information about what happened. As it turns out, after the one session of EMDR, she recalled that she had been part of a rape and torture with uh, multiple individuals, both as victims and uh, perpetrators. The interesting thing at that point in time, uh, looking at the quantitative EEG that I did back then, was uh, you can see some normalization. Uh, if you look pre and post, you can see a good deal of normalization in the normal waking thinking frequencies. But here in uh, the interhemispheric coherences, you can see this is very, very abnormal in the low frequencies. And if you look over here, you see it being totally uh, normalized in those same places once the repressed information uh, had been remembered. I bring that up simply because we have also similar kinds of evidence when we look at quantitative EEGs over the course of uh, four weeks of treatment for a generalized anxiety disorder. Up here on the left, you see the representation of what a normal healthy brain would look like, and here you see uh, at the beginning, the representation of someone who suffers from general anxiety with a lot of hyperarousal in the frontal lobes, occipital, temporal lobes, being very hot after four sessions of energy psychology, tapping sessions, if you will. What we see is a normalization beginning to move forward in the brain from the occipital regions. After eight sessions, moving forward even still, and then when we're finished after 12 sessions, you can see an almost complete normalization of functioning throughout the entire brain. All of this information is left-brained. All of it serves to begin to convince you that maybe these things are real. But what really convinces all of us who are in this field, who started as skeptics, is a personal experience of the power of a very simple procedure. And so I'd like to take perhaps five minutes time just to demonstrate to you 
in a personal way with an experience of what energy psychology can do for you. So I would ask you to start by giving some thought to something that's disturbing that you would like to change so that it wasn't so disturbing. Something that perhaps you've been unable to overcome in time. It could be a concern about the future, a memory from the past. It could even be a physical symptom. And as you give thought to that, what I would ask you to do is to just take note now, give it a name, and take note of how disturbing this is to you on a zero to 10 scale, where zero is neutral, no disturbance, and 10 is as disturbing as something can possibly be for you. And write that number from zero to 10 down on a piece of paper. So now you have something in mind, you have a name for it, whatever name, simple name that reminds you of what it is, and you have a number that represents how disturbing it is as you hold it in your mind's eye right now. I'd like for you to begin to tap the side of your hands together like this. And as you tap your hands together, say, even though I have this disturbance, I love and accept myself. Even though I have this problem, you can name the problem in your mind, I love and accept all of me, especially that part of me that is still so disturbed. Even though I have this disturbance in my mind, in my body, in my thoughts, in my emotions, I love and accept myself. Good. Now, thinking of that problem, tap here under your nose. Let me tap about seven times. Think of the problem, name it. Repeat the name as you tap under your lower lip. Very simply, tap now on the inside tip of your eyebrows. And then, right underneath your eyes, on the bone, the suborbital notch there, tap there. Tap under your arm, about four inches below your armpit. It's a very tender spot, you'll be able to find it. And tap under the collarbones, where the collarbones meet the breastbone. Thinking of the problem, tap back under the eyes and under the collarbones. Tap here on the pinky nails, on the thumb side of the nail itself. And as you tap there, say, I forgive myself. I'm doing the best I can. I forgive all the people and circumstances that contributed to this problem. There is forgiveness in my heart for myself and others. Tap on your index finger nails and say, I forgive myself. It happened. Tapping on your middle finger nails, think, I renounce all the past experiences and events that have contributed to this problem and I recall my life energy from all of those times and places. And tapping under your nose and under your eyes under your collarbones, and once again under your arms. Good. Now, tap on the back of your hand, on the space in between the bones that go to your ring finger and your pinky. Continue tapping there all the time, and close your eyes and then open your eyes. Slowly, deliberately look down to the right, and then to the left. Slowly circle your eyes all around in a big circle, all the way around the outside of the visual field. Go around slowly all the way again. And then circle your eyes back in the other direction, all the way around the outside of the visual field. That's good. Now, thinking of the problem, tap under your nose, under your lower lip. The inside tip of the eyebrows near the bridge of the nose, underneath the eyes, right on the bone, underneath the eyes, underneath your arms on the sides on that tender spot, underneath the collarbones, underneath the eyes, underneath the collarbones. The little fingernail, pinky nail. Think of someone you love 
and say, there is love in my heart. There is love in my heart. There is love in my heart for myself and others. Tap on the index fingernails, the middle fingernails, under your nose, under the eyes, under the collarbones, and under the arms. Now stop. Tune into the problem. What do you notice? How disturbing is the problem now, zero to 10? Write it down. Okay, how many people saw a reduction in that number? Okay. What else did you experience besides a re reduction in that disturbance? Yeah, very commonly we have that phenomenon where we feel ourselves in a situation, as we recall it, and after simply one round of treatment, we see ourselves as being somehow more of an observer outside of the situation. Yeah, that's a common response. Anybody else care to share before we move on? Okay. Pardon me? Quietness, yes. Yes, there's a quietness, a calmness as those neurochemicals change, as serotonin increases, our mood elevates. As endorphins and enkephalins rise, our physical discomfort begins to quiet. Hopefully this experience has at least as much meaning as all the words that I've said to this point in time. But let me continue on. And uh, I may have a little difficulty because several of my slides are motion slides coming up. But I'd like to talk today a little more about the realities of thought. Um, thought is, as I said, at the top of the hierarchy. And as we rebalance the field of thought, all that happens downstream as the dominoes fall begins to become more orderly and online. The Buddha said, we are what we think. All that we are arises with our thought, and with our thought, we make the world. Another famous quote is by Rene Descartes, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. And Descartes is often remembered for um, his divorcing of science and psychology by saying that the mind could only be studied introspectively and allowing the field of psychology to languish for 200 years while other sciences began to move and progress. But nonetheless, in some significant ways, they were both right because the creative power of our thought is causal to who we are and to whom we experience in our experience of life and this reality. One scientific study of thought has to do with a field that's become known as intentionally imprinted electronic devices. Again, a field started by William Tiller, and these studies have been replicated in many, many ways and many, many times. And here is where science becomes stranger than fiction. A typical experiment would take four individuals who have highly coherent thought, remember the interhemispheric coherence measures, which basically means that the homologous areas of the brain are working in phase. People who demonstrate high coherence are most often practiced meditators, very practiced meditators. And if you take four of them and you have them sit around a table and think to the indwelling consciousness of an electronic device, perhaps a clock radio, that it might do something like change the pH value of water by increasing it by one unit, a factor of 10 hydrogen molecules. And if they were to think to this in dwelling consciousness of this electronic device for perhaps 20 or 30 minutes until they felt complete, wrap the device up and ship it off to some laboratory in the world, bring another device and think just the opposite, that it would in fact decrease the pH value of water by one unit, and go ahead and make a lot of these units 
over time and send them to different places around the world. And when those units were plugged in and the pH value of the water was observed, in just a matter of days, the pH value changed exactly in the direction that it was imprinted with. And oddly enough, the effect over the course of months spread to adjacent buildings. And we found that at sea level, it changes exactly one unit. Below sea level, it changes a little more than one unit. And higher above sea level, it changes a little less than one unit. We're learning quite a lot about the power of our intention. And this brings us to the power of thought and the law of attraction, which has been popularized in media. Ooh, five minutes. OK, very fast. Um, popularized in media like um, The Secret, for example. Most people think, you know, the secret is you ask, you believe, and you receive. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be quite that simple because I see a lot of people around me who don't like what they have, don't want what they have, and nonetheless have that experience. And then if they believe the law of attraction, they suffer a tremendous amount of guilt because they have, in fact, created this mess in which they find themselves. One way to think about the law of attraction has to do with a time where I was out enjoying a beautiful day, sunny, and a field of daffodils was there. And I thought, oh, how wonderful, beautiful the yellow. It's so highly saturated in the sunshine. It feels like it could drip right off if you touched it. And you know, I wanted that yellow. I desired it. And then my mind was taken to the sky. And as I looked up into the beautiful blue sky, I thought, oh, what a beautiful blue. I love that. It's so magnificent. I desire it. I want it in my life. And then I fell asleep. And as I slept, I thought of what I desired. And when I awoke, I awoke to a world that gave me exactly what I asked for. It gave me the blues and the yellows, which combined to a green. So one of the things that we know is that we have choices about things, but we must be very careful about what we choose and what we ask for. We give thought to what we desire with strong positive emotion, for emotion is the magnetic drawing quality that attracts into the physical plane that to which thought it is attached. And the more intense the emotion, the more drawing power it has. We need to become more aware of our thought. And we need to learn to avoid the thoughts that we don't desire. So in energy psychology, we never try to stop doing anything. We simply learn to promote the incompatible positive. Because if you think about as cognitive psychology would have you ask why, the more you think about the problem, the more involved with it you become, the more thought you give it, the more life energy and thought energy you give it, the more a part of your reality it becomes. Try not to give thought to why, because you'll understand why. But when something triggers the negative experience, it will happen just the same. Use other methods to change. Now, this is a uh, Welcome to Flatland, which was a book. And this part of the presentation is supposed to be uh, in moving pictures. But I'll simply say that if you were a very smart Flatlander, and you started out at one end of Flatland, and you wanted to get to the other, you'd say, oh, I can do that. I just draw a straight line to get from one side to the other. Flatland is a two-dimensional universe. It has length and width, but not even the depth or thickness of a piece of paper. And as you went through your experience on Flatland, which this is not going to show you, or perhaps it will, uh, you would go, and after a little while, you would stop, and you would find your Flatland GPS shows that you're a little bit off course, and that's dismaying. And you would continue on after recalculating your GPS and to find yourself later oh, in this place where you certainly don't want to be. And you would say, oh, no, this is a terrible situation. I'm not at all enjoying this experience of my reality. I keep thinking and giving thought to that which I want, but I find myself moving farther and farther away from it. And so I am suffering negative emotions in my experience. But the truth about Flatland, we know as creatures of three dimensions in time, because when we look at Flatland, what we see is that, indeed, Flatland isn't flat at all. And a Flatlander having to remain on the flat surface can't go in a straight line from one side of flat land to the other because he can't go up over mountains. He can't go up at all. He has to stay on flat land. And so we see that the flatlander who was moving in this direction was in, 
all the time, moving towards his destination in the way that was possible for him. And similarly, if we had a higher dimensional perspective on our reality, if we simply keep our mind on what it is that we desire with strong positive emotion, we can understand that our experience, no matter how contrary it might seem to our reasoning and our plan to get there, is nonetheless the way and path we need to travel in order to find these things out. Now I'm going to skip over some Zen Co Cohen's about things and I guess I'd like to end up by saying that um, I studied it initially with Roger Callahan, who introduced me to uh, Callahan techniques, thought field therapy. And while I was there, I was there for a week, and on the second night, I had a dream. And in this dream, I was part of a group that taught and led an army of energy healers. And I saw in this dream that my student, 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 would be working with one individual, removing the perturbation from their thought field, removing that disturbance. And when that one disturbance from that one individual was removed, it was also removed from the overriding field of thought energy for our species. And at that moment in time, we reached a tipping point where the consciousness of humanity morphed such that for even the least amongst us, we had access to our psychic gifts. And as I stand here before you today, part of that army of energy healers, and I know that that army has grown to thousands now throughout the world, I want you as you return to wherever you came from and you're working to help heal the suffering of one individual, to wonder, is this the one? Is this the one? Thank you very much.